Michael Pittman Jr. somehow finds a way to log a limited practice following this concussion. And I'll tell you, I say this about a number of players probably. Zaire Franklin off the top of my head, I know I say it about, but I'll say it about Michael Pittman too. This guy has to be one of my favorite players on the Indianapolis Colts. Period. I, I mean, I don't get jerseys often. I don't have Michael Pittman Jr.'s jersey, and I don't get jerseys often basically just because if the guy's not on the team anymore, uh, particularly when they're on the rookie contract, I, I just stay clear because you never know if they're going to stay with the team or not. You know, all, all these types of things, right? Pittman, I assume, is going to end up staying with the Indianapolis Colts, and maybe I'll end up with his jersey at some point or another. But that's not here nor there because we had just watched him endure what was really just a horrific hit against the Pittsburgh Steelers. And in the post-game reaction and analysis that I put out, I didn't really talk too much about it for whatever reason. And I figured this is probably a good opportunity to do it. And, and I do have some mixed thoughts on it. Oh, real quick, hold on. Check out this thing, huh? Hey, I mean, I mean, come on, right? That thing, by the way, it is so comfortable. This has to be it's this is awesome. They call them ugly Christmas sweaters. Not only is this not ugly, this might be one of the freshest pieces of apparel I own. Period. Uh, and I just wanted to show it off for you guys because I'm in the holiday spirit, right? But it, the hit, right? We go back to the hit, right? Let's not get too far off track, Justin. Stick with it, baby. I haven't released an episode in a few days, so I do have some mixed thoughts on that hit on Michael Pittman because as far as the hit itself. I do think it's twofold. In fact, dare I say threefold? I'm not even sure if that's a real thing, but but there's really quite a few talking points there, right? Because on one hand, you do not want to see hits like that in the NFL. And with that, the NFL has made their stance on hits like that abundantly clear as to how those are going to be called throughout the course of a game. And really, they put the hammer down even more so, not just with the penalty, but by giving the guy a season-long suspension, right? On the other hand, secondly, Michael Pittman is about to catch that football, right? He is laid out there, and this is a game for the Steelers and the Colts, both, where their season is essentially on the line. As a defender, you're looking at Michael Pittman. You know how great he is. You know he's about to catch that ball. I mean, you got to do something. You can't just let him catch it. And as Pittman's laid out, I, I mean, with the speed things are moving, in the NFL, you do just wonder how practical it is to expect a guy to hit someone in the exact spot they're going to hit them at the exact moment they're supposed to hit them there all at once. So you kind of got a feel for the defender on some front because it's not an easy spot to be in, let alone the fact that the NFL doesn't want you going low either. Not that this is one of those situations, but you got to hit the guy somewhere to tackle him, right? What is it that you're supposed to do as a defender? I'm not the first one to bring this up, but you do have to ask neither here nor there. The hit clearly was at least a little unnecessary. I mean, I guess you could jump on his back, but listen, all I'm saying is I sympathize with defenders in that situation. If it was flipped and that was uh, Deontay Johnson and Julian Blackman came down and laid the lumber like that, I mean, we would be bringing up some of those things. What is he supposed to do, right? So it's only fair to be objective to the guy on the Steelers. Now, third, and perhaps most importantly, because I feel like this is the point that is getting missed, is Gardner Minshew, who did have a very good game, really threw Michael Pittman into a situation on that one, right? And it wasn't the only time Pittman did it during that game. The one to Josh Downs out of the slot over the middle comes to mind. Might have even been the same guy on the Steelers that laid that hit on Josh Downs. And there's a few others. That's just the first one I can think of. But once upon a time, these hits that are now called not only illegal, but are getting guys suspensions were allowed in the NFL, right? And it was expected given these hits can be had, that a quarterback would protect his receiver. It was a very important aspect of the game. I think even I heard Tom Brady talk about this recently, but I mean, I, I do think about this quite often, particularly when you have a guy like Garner Minshew, who is a little reckless with his ball placement. For example, let's say, um, I don't know how uh, you know familiar you guys are with defensive terminology, so I'm going to keep it relatively simple on this one and just hope that you're that far along. If not, I'll try my best to explain it. Imagine defense 
running a cover two, right? So you have a corner on the outside, you have the safety over top, and then you kind of have this linebacker sitting in a zone in the middle here. So let's say you have, we'll call it Michael Pittman Jr. on the outside lined up in front of that corner. You have Josh Downs inside of him. You got Josh Downs running a flat to push that corner at out and Michael Pittman running a slant underneath him. So in, in one scenario, Michael Pittman, if that corner were to take the flat, is open now, right? And there's a pocket in between that corner and what is the outside linebacker on that side, right? As a quarterback, if you throw that ball in a spot where you're leading Michael Pittman, even if he's open, this isn't flag football, there's contact. You throw that ball and you lead him into the linebacker, that's a very tough spot for Michael Pittman Jr. to be in, right? Once upon a time, the move would be, and quarterbacks still do it. I say once upon a time, like I'm like 80 years old, but as a quarterback, you're going to want to put that ball, even if Pittman is open, you're going to want to put that ball low, perhaps, just as a you know, just as one way to do it. You want to put that ball low so he has to go down for it, ultimately protecting him from running into a linebacker who is going to clean his clock, right? That is something that is expected of an NFL quarterback. It is something that Garner Minshew did not do on that play, and I can't let him off the hook for it because ultimately – that is not is going to be something that continues to happen. A defender can only do so much, and the reason those hits continue to happen are not because guys want to get suspended. It's not because they want to get fined. It's because it's really, really hard to go your entire life playing one way and then all of a sudden have to switch to another way. It's just really hard not to lay the lumber on a guy in that situation, particularly given the stakes of that game. That's going to be something that Garner Minshew has to keep his mind on. I, I don't know how, again, in, in the speed of the game, it, it's easier said than done. But it is something to observe, and I think it's something to be pointed out, and I think it's a talking point that's being missed. I wanted to bring it up. But anywho, I mean, now we are in a spot where Pittman, albeit a limited practice today, or I guess yesterday, or I'm recording it on Wednesday. This is coming out on Thursday. It is likely not to play this week against the Falcons. I mean, it is possible that he does play, I guess, because the game was on a Saturday and not a Sunday. But I mean, when? I haven't kept track. When does anyone come back the week after they get the concussion, right? I believe not only do you need to pass whatever testing it is that you have to pass, but you have to also log two full practices along with passing that tests or those tests rather as part of the protocol that comes along with playing a game after a concussion. You do have to wonder what the Colts offense is gonna or would look like without Michael Pittman Jr. on the field for a full game. Now, albeit they did play the Steelers, and it, I believe was 13 to 7 when he got hurt, which means they scored 23 unanswered without him on the field. But just because that happened does not mean that there is nothing to discuss here and nothing to be worried about, nothing to be concerned about. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do, as always, have to introduce myself. My name is Justin. This right here is the Ride in the Bench Colts cast. As always, I ask anyone that is enjoying the episode, go ahead, shoot it a like. It's going to help me get out to as many Colts fans as humanly possible. And a whole bunch of them are going to be watching content as the Colts make an unlikely run to the fucking Super Bowl, baby. So that's what that is. If you want to stick around for the journey, perhaps you're a returning listener, right? Where's my props? Where are my props? Right? Yeah. Even though I could never be a nerd with this awesome sweater on, 50% of people that watch this channel are not subscribed. So if that is you and you are one of the people that continues to come back, continues to enjoy the content and is not yet subscribed, I ask that perhaps be the day. But most importantly, as always, just enjoy the content, drop a comment, whatever it is, or, or just, you know, just sit there by yourself and just and just watch it and leave. I mean, I don't care. As long as you're here and you're enjoying it, really, that is all that matters. Is it really all that matters? I, I don't know. I have my motives, right? But, you know, enjoy the video, right? I don't want to take too much time on it. Let's get back into it. So as far as how the offense looks without Pittman, as a team, as any team, not just the Colts, as any team, almost general football discussion here, you go into a week with a offensive, well, offensive and defensive, but for the sake of this discussion, offense, right? You go into the week with an offensive game plan and a set of plays that you feel like are going to work against the team that you are playing. So going into Pittsburgh, the Colts had their entire game plan with Michael Pittman involved, and ultimately they had to figure it out on the fly, right? DJ Montgomery was able to come in and make some plays, but lucky for the Indianapolis Colts, they were able to run the ball all over the Steelers with Trey Sermon, with, is it Tyler Goodson, Mike Goodson? I, I mean, no disrespect, but it, it's, I, listen, I have a show about the Colts. It's not very often I don't know a guy's name. That guy came out of nowhere, okay? And he's back on the practice squad going into this week. But point being, they ran the ball all over the Steelers, right? But what if they were not able to run the ball all over the Steelers, right? 
That is the scenario you have to examine. That is the scenario you have to be prepared for. If you're prepared for the worst, when it doesn't go that bad, you are like ultra prepared, right? And, and keep in mind, you know, it's, we're not exactly loaded out here with weapons right now. Without Pittman, Isaiah McKenzie suspended for something we'll never know about, most likely, unless he speaks about it in future years on his own. Shane Steichen certainly is never going to tell us. You know how good he is keeping that type of information. Dueling we haven't had, right? Jawan Winfrey, we assume, comes up from the practice squad. Jaden Mickens, right? These, these are the guys we're going to be going out there with. So where do the pieces, if we had to rely on Garner Minshew's arm, where do the pieces in this passing game fall schematically without Michael Pittman Jr. there, all right? Because you got Pierce, Downs, Montgomery, Winfrey, and Mickens, right? That's not exactly ideal going into a must-win game. And Michael Pittman, in case you hadn't realized yet, or in case perhaps you were on one side of the fence um, early in the season and now you're starting to realize you should have been on the other, he is so important to this offense it is unbelievable. I mean, the Colts are not exactly built to produce offensively with any form of consistency without Michael Pittman Jr. I mean, the skill set that he brings, right? Because he's an all-around receiver. I think maybe he had been typecasted a little bit into kind of the fact that he was just kind of like this guy that's going to get you seven yards here, six yards there, 12 yards there, and that was it. But I mean, he may just be a chain mover, right? But I mean, he's a big guy, strong hands, contested catches. He's been able to prove over and over again. I mean, he's proven over and over again that he can make big time catches in big time moments in traffic over a guy, around the guy, et cetera, et cetera. Must I explain? You can also not sleep on Michael Pittman down the field, right? Now we have guys that are able to fill individual pieces, right? Like we have guys that can move the chains, right? You got uh, like Josh Downs is like a chain moving type of guy. You have an Alec Pierce who can make a contested catch. DJ Montgomery able to come out there and make some plays, but you don't have one guy in this offense that is able to do all of those things, all of them. You have some guys that are close, right? I think Josh Downs can do quite a few things, but God himself struck down on Josh Downs and said, there's certain things you can't do. We know he can play bigger than he is, but bigger than he is doesn't mean Michael Pittman Jr., who is really prototypically sized as a wide receiver. So who exactly takes Michael Pittman's spot in the offense? Now, of course, you got to spread the ball around a bit, right? There's ways to supplement, but literally there are plays in the playbook. I'm talking schematically, right? There are plays in this playbook, and clearly a lot of them. I don't know how many targets a game Pittman's getting, probably something along the lines of 14 or 15 a game. These plays are designed specifically with Michael Pittman Jr. in mind, whether it be where he's lined up or if he's being targeted, whatever it is, these plays are designed kind of with him as a piece of them, right? Other guys can be plugged in, but Pittman is an integral part of the offense. Now, who takes that spot in the play calling, right? Because you got to call the same plays you've been practicing, but now you have a lot that are designed for a guy that isn't there. So who steps in into Pittman's spot on some of these plays, and how many guys do we have are mentally prepared to take on the extra burden, right? Because it's not just, oh, you throw him in and he has a skill set to do this, right? With that becomes, you know, new routes that you have to run. Perhaps the spacing is different. Perhaps your responsibilities on a given play are different. Perhaps you have an option route. Maybe some of the tree is a little bit different in that part, or rather in Pittman's role than what you're used to. I don't know all these things to be true. I'm just bringing in some of the nuances that have to be you know, disgust because, you know, I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill given how great Sykin is, the fucking huge brain on Shane Sykin, right? I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill, but, you know, these things absolutely do matter, particularly at this point in the season with how important these games are that we're about to be playing and preparing on a moment's notice, on a week's notice, all of a sudden you don't have your target hog, top three in receptions in football, He's not there. I mean, if you're able to run the ball like you did against the Steelers moving forward, or at least moving into this week against Atlanta, uh, then I guess, you know, this conversation isn't all that important. But I am curious, you, you know, kind of what this ends up looking like, particularly with the outside guys. I think you know that, uh, you know, Downs' target share it, it is going to go up. We're going to be seeing a little bit more looks going his way out of the slot. But on the outside, right, your X receiver, your Y receiver, your Z receiver, I, I forget the terminology, wh whatever. You get the guys on the outside. Those guys right there. What is that going to look like? Now, this is a huge opportunity. Obviously, we know who's going to be lined up there, but, but who's taking Pittman's spot? That's what I'm talking about. This is a huge opportunity for Alec Pierce 
if they trust him to take on a good chunk of that target share. I actually think that Pierce's skill set it far more fits the role that Michael Pittman Jr. plays than the one that Alec Pierce is playing. I think he's kind of been typecasted into a role that he's not built for, which is this deep threat. That's why there's the stat out there about him running like 150 deep routes, only getting nine targets. I don't think that's his game. I think he is much more kind of in the Pittman mold. Uh, and I, this is an opportunity to see if perhaps if the Colts feel the same way that I do, or if they're just going to keep having him do what he's doing and, and just figure it out from there. I don't know. Do we see more targets to the tight ends? I, I don't know. I literally am asking questions. I'm not asking questions to answer them. I'm asking open-ended questions, right? I, I just want to make sure that this point does not get lost, right? It's not just about losing the player, Michael Pittman. It, it, it's about the offense at large, the playbook, where he sits on those plays schematically and how we're able to plug guys into those spots when we deem necessary and, and who goes where. Maybe it's not one guy running all of Pittman's route for a game. Maybe those guys share those duties. I don't know, but guys are going to have to be ready to, to come in. And this is just another bit of adversity for the Indianapolis Colts to overcome because I'm assuming that he's not going to play just because no one ever plays the week after they get the concussion. But lucky for us, it has been the type of season where we've done a whole lot of adversity overcoming, you know, pause. Never is there such thing as overcoming. I mean, eh, 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 eh. all right, disgusting, disgusting, Justin. But uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, we're headed into a game. By no means is this game going to be easy against the Atlanta Falcons, and we really got to come out and re be ready to produce without our best wide receiver. Not just our best, mind you. Michael Pittman Jr. is easily our best receiver. It, it's really him on an island by himself, and then everyone else after him if you ask me, right? And when you talk about Shane Steichen being the coach of the year, and he rightfully is in that conversation. I believe right now he, he's splitting the favorite, depending on what sports book you look at. It's him and Dan Campbell and, and D'Amico Ryans, right? There's a lot to be decided. Ultimately, if Shane Steichen is going to win coach of the year, the Colts are going to have to make the playoffs. And maybe the Texans are not going to have to. And then we'll see what, you know, the Lions, do they make a run, right? There's some factors. Shane Steichen is not sure fire guaranteed coach of the year now he's our coach of the year and absolutely should be a front runner for it but there's some nuance to you know who's going to win that and, and it's not going to be decided yet the season has to continue to play out but when you have that conversation it's moments like this in a game as important as this falcons one without michael pittman jr if they were able to overcome it and win this game the magnitude everything that is on the line that would really go a long way in bolstering shane steichen's case for coach of the year and uh, yeah, I, I mean, that's the entire episode about Michael Pittman. I'll be back again, I think, tomorrow. Tomorrow being Friday. It's either going to be tomorrow or Saturday with the game preview going in against the Falcons. Spoiler alert, I really do like our chances against the Falcons, but I am worried about the Falcons on some level. It's not just going to be an easy game. The Falcons game is going to be close. We're going to talk about it in a little more depth in the next episode. But until then, that's all of this episode. My name is Justin. This right here was the Ride in the Bench Colts cast. If you have not liked, subscribe yet. Now is the time. But as always, go Colts.